morning. There's a verse that we'll probably talk about today. That's in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, speak the truth in love. You know, we announced the Easter choir. And Andy said, if you're standing, you're eligible for the choir. Um, If you're really serious about it, I'm, you might want to just ask the person beside you that was singing along with you <laughs> this morning if you're really qualified. Is that okay? Better? And also, I wanted to mention about the summer training program. There, you know, it says details will follow. Um, basically, at this point, I'm, Rick and I will be meeting on Tuesday <clears throat> to, uh, to plan it. Um, you know, STP, we've done several years in the past, and our goal is to always make it better. And so we're going to be looking at uh, what we've had in the past and what we'd like to do to improve it. And so hopefully by the end of this week, um, I will have an application with all of the details. So if you're interested in the summer training program, go ahead and just shoot me an email that says, I'd like an application. And then I'll get all the details worked out and send you what we have, what we're offering. But uh, needless to say, it will be at least as good as, as it's been in the past, um, probably a little bit better. So uh, go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 as you're considering what you want to do with your summer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The passage that I was assigned is uh, verses 9 through 12, but I'd like to read together with you this morning, starting in verse 5. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul talking to the Thessalonians about his visit to them, and when he established the church, um, we see that in, in Acts 17. But he said, in t- regarding his visit, we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. But we proved to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having thus a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly behaved, we behaved towards you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Let's pray one more time together. Lord, we do want to thank you for your word, and we pray that as we consider it together this morning that... <clears throat> You'd speak to our hearts. Lord, speak to mine as you've been doing this week. Help us to interact with you and with your word, Lord, not to listen to a sermon, but to interact with the God of the Bible. We ask that you be honored and glorified and that we'd be changed by your word and by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Marvin Trudy fell in love when they were in college. Can you relate? She was actually a swimmer, he was a football player, and he graduated first, and she actually quit school to marry her college sweetheart. They were very excited, as you can imagine. And as things happen in marriage, and we won't go into any details, but uh, soon they were expecting a child, and they were thrilled over the moon. They really wanted to pour all of their life into their kids and make life for their children fantastic. In fact... Um, Marv was quoted as saying, some guys think the most important thing in life is their jobs or the stock market or whatever. To me, it was my kids. The question I asked myself was, how well could a kid develop if you provided him with the perfect environment? So during the pregnancy, Trudy used no salt, no sugar, no alcohol or tobacco. 
When, when born, the little, the little guy was, was fed only fresh vegetables, fruits, and raw milk. I don't even know what raw milk is, but apparently it's, it's healthy. Later on in life, when this child began to develop, there was actually an article written about him in Sports Illustrated. It was called, Bread to be a Superstar. It says this, He has never eaten a Big Mac or an Oreo cookie or a Ding Dong. Talk about satanic parents. <laughs> when we went to birthday parties as a kid, he would take his own cake and ice cream to avoid sugar and refined white flour. He would eat homemade... <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> he would eat homemade ketchup prepared with honey. I'm not sure what that's all about. He did consume beef, but not the kind injected with hormones. And he only ate unprocessed dairy products. He teethed on frozen kidney and liver. <laughs> he was probably a skinny kid. <laughs> but listen to this. When, when the baby was one month old, again, this is all reported in Sports Illustrated. When the baby was one month old, uh, Marv was already working on his son's physical condition. Again, Marv is the dad. He was stretching this little guy's hamstrings. Okay, one month old, he's like doing the hamstring stretch. <laughs> then he taught him how to do push-ups. <laughs> one, one month old. Again, this is, all, this is all documented. Apparently, he even invented a game where the baby would try to lift a medicine ball up onto the kitchen table. Marv got a balance beam and put his child on the balance beam to, to work on his balance, of course. And, and he says, well, you know, these activities did get easier as Junior learned how to walk. <laughs> and, of course, they put a football in his crib from day one. But not an NFL football. That would be just wrong. It was a stuffed football <laughs> to make sure the little guy didn't get hurt. But you know what? It paid off. As a freshman in high school, young Todd became the first freshman to ever start a varsity football game for Orange County. And he went on to break all of the county's passing records. The national high school record was also something that he eclipsed. 9,914 yards in total passing yards, including 2,477 in his senior year. He received numerous honors, including the Parade All-American, National High School Coaches Association's Offensive Player of the Year, National High School Scholar Athlete of the Year, and National High School Player of the Year, all in 1987. His parents had created a perfect environment, and the results were fantastic. Needless to say, he was sought after by many of the top college football programs, including BYU, Miami, Washington, and Stanford. He actually ended up settling on his parents' alma mater, the University of Southern California, USC. While there, he had a pretty successful career as well. In fact, he was nominated for the Heisman Trophy the outstanding athlete in college football in 1990. From there, he was drafted into the NFL, 1991. The second quarterback drafted in the draft, the third quarterback, you might be familiar with, a guy named Brett Favre. This guy was drafted before Brett Favre. His signing contract, $2.25 million dollars. Now, again, that's not a lot these days, but this is 1991. His parents had paid off in dividends. All that work, all of those vegetables, all that <laughs> liver, and all that medicine ball. Marv and Trudy Marinovich had produced the perfect child. Or had they? You see, in 1991, Todd was arrested for possession of cocaine, the same year he was drafted a professional football player. 1997, he was arrested on suspicion of growing marijuana. Again, not as big a deal these days, but back in 1997. April of 2000, he was arrested for sexual assault, followed by a 2001 arrest on suspicion of heroin possession. 2004, Jesse, you like this one? He was arrested for skateboarding in a prohibited zone. <laughs> 2005, arrested for possession of drug paraphernalia. 
2007, felony drug possession and resisting a police officer. Later that year, so two in the same year, arrested again, felony possession of methamphetamine and syringe possession and resisting arrest. 2009, failure to appear to report progress from a drug rehabilitation program, state-sponsored, of course. And finally, 2016, arrested after being found naked and in possession of drugs in a neighbor's backyard, trying to enter their house. Not sure how Marvin Trudy feel about all those records. Do you have children? What environment are you providing for them? What are your goals for your children? Now, if you don't have physical children, you're in good company because the Apostle Paul didn't either. But he had spiritual children, and he had goals for them as well. And so as we look at this passage today, we're going to see what his goal was for his children. You see it in verse 12 of chapter 2. So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Paul's goal for the Thessalonians, and by extension for us, is that we would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls us into his kingdom and glory. The message this morning is really twofold. First of all, it's going to offer some guidelines for those who are caring for others. Maybe we could call you spiritual parents, disciplers, mentors, people who are investing in the lives of others. And it's going to give you some guidelines as to how to help people become mature in their Christian walk. But it's also for everyone else as well, because it's going to call each of us to walk in a manner worthy of the God who has saved us. It's going to be a challenge for us to take a look at the manner in which we walk or conduct our daily lives. If you haven't been with us as we started this study in 1 Thessalonians a couple weeks ago, let's just kind of get up to speed as to where we've been. At the beginning of the book, of course, there's an introduction, and then Paul gives thanks for the faith, the hope, and the love that he's seen in the lives of the Thessalonian believers. From there, he goes on to kind of praise them, if you will, for becoming not only imitators of him, but then becoming examples of those who should believe, those who do believe. And in fact, it says that there, the word had gone out through all of Macedonia. The entire Santa Clara Valley, if you will, would have heard about the believers in Thessalonica because they had become examples and followers of God in the way that Paul had shown them. And then last week we see as, as Paul kind of focuses a little bit more on himself and his ministry towards them, um, he talks about the fact that he was entrusted by God to bring the gospel to the Thessalonians. And you remember Charlie talked about us being entrusted as well, seeking an approved unto God degree, uh, like Jim Elliott did when he was in college. And so that brings us to our passage today, which is talking about <clears throat> Paul's goal and his approach to seeing us walking worthy of the God who called us. The goal, as I said that we would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. His approach, to treat them like a mother and to treat them like a father. Yeah, I have experience in one, uh, I'm working on the other. This concept of walking and the goal that Paul has, he, he expounds in other parts of the Bible. And so I wanted to actually turn, if you would, in your Bibles. It's on the screen, but I like, like the, the real thing. So look in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians 1, starting in verse 9, again, the same concept as Paul begins a letter to another church in another city. He's thanking God for them and how they're doing. But then he says, for this reason, also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. He wants them to understand this newfound faith that they have in Christ. Why? So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, 
joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He wants them to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. He goes on in that same chapter, at the end of the chapter, in verse 28. Sorry about the 12 at the end there. It says, And we proclaim Him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, that we may present every man complete or mature in Christ. And for this purpose also I labor, striving according to the power which mightily works within me. Paul's desire is to help the Colossians, the Thessalonians, and indeed, as he says, every man to come to maturity in Christ. Everyone he came in contact with, he wanted to help them to grow. That's something that we can do as well. Now, you're probably thinking, yeah, but I'm not Paul. And you know what? You're right. But it doesn't matter. The same God, the same Holy Spirit can work through you as he did through the Apostle Paul. And Paul gives us some guidelines, principles that we can use. And if we put them into practice, I believe that God will use you and I to help other people to grow in their Christian life. So we want to look at those as we look at Paul's approach to discipleship, to mentoring, to caring, to pastoring, whatever word you want to use uh, to have an impact to help others in their Christian life. He saw those that he dealt with as spiritual children. And his goal was to help those children to grow. And so how does a child grow? The input of their parents. So fortunately, I have a little bit of experience, but I'm going to have to draw on watching uh, others to help you understand this as well. And let me just say that um, I've made, and you, I have a couple of witnesses, I've made plenty of mistakes as a parent um, for which I have repented in, in sackcloth and ashes, um, but by God's grace, my kids are still alive and um, still interested in the things of the Lord, uh, but boy, it's tough. It's really tough to be a parent, and you know, you never stop being a parent. My kids are 26 and 23, and it's getting harder. I thought I was like, okay, 18, I, I did it. They survived. Then they started thinking <laughs> for themselves. And man, I realized how poorly I had, I had done and some of the mistakes I'd made. But there's some good things. And so the, these principles that we look at today, um, it's not necessarily specifically for your children, although we are, as parents, primarily uh, those responsible for our kids. But it's also, as I said, for those who want to be spiritual parents, those who want to help others grow in their Christian walk. And so we'll walk, just walk through these um, one at a time and see what we can learn. So again, he says at the beginning uh, of the section in verse 7, we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Moms are pretty incredible, aren't they? They're so Nice. Us guys are kind of like, not as nice. <laughs> and again, I'm speaking just for myself. I don't know about you. might be like way nicer than your wife. I don't know. But I'm not as nice as mine. There's just some things about them. It's, I don't know if, if I can say like they're soft. But I'm not talking about like Pillsbury soft. I'm talking about <laughs> character-wise. Right? There's just something about ladies and moms in particular, it's different. And again, I, I, I can't relate as well because I grew up in a house with, with two brothers that you know, it was constantly um, not soft. Um, and so I'm not sure I, I never knew how to relate to girls. And I think you can attest that there was a lot of training and learning uh, along that process. But boy, she's good at it because it comes natural. And again, I'm sure those of you that have become moms, you're like, how do I do this? And then, like, 0.36 milliseconds after that baby is born, you go, I got this. Because it's just natural. You just know what to do. It's not quite as natural, unfortunately, in the spiritual life. We have to think about it. We have to pray about it. We have to work at it. But there's some principles here that I think can help. 
First of all, he says, they're gentle. Okay, again, we're, we're thinking again in the context of me as a Christian trying to help, care for, mentor a younger believer in the faith. Okay. The first thing Paul says is to be gentle. You know, I'm, I'm of the, the mindset of when I become a Christian, I become a soldier, a follower of Christ, a disciple. It's difficult, it's challenging, it's hard, I'm committed. Gentle doesn't seem to fit that context for me. And that's why so many of you hate me. <laughs> we have to be gentle. We have to be caring. And actually, in the definition of the word, it talks about just being childlike and innocent and simple. Just being nice. And you know what's so weird about this? Again, thinking of being a parent, is I'm, I was and have been much nicer to your kids than I am to my own. And you think about that. When you get into the confines, the protection, the isolation of your own home, do you act differently than you do at church on Sunday morning? It's a lot easier to be gentle when there's 200 witnesses than it is when there's none. We need to be gentle and tender with those young ones, again, physically as well as spiritually. We need to be tender. The word means to warm, to cherish. I wanted to show a picture of a nursing mother, but I thought it might be a little bit inappropriate, so I looked at a couple. But you can just see the look on the mother's face of tenderness. And again, there's something... I remember when Eric was really little, a lot of times I would, I'd be laying on the couch after like a strenuous workout or something, I'm sure, not like <laughs> lazily watching TV. And he would just come and I just, Vicky would lay him on my, on my chest and he'd just fall asleep. And I know it's not the same as tenderly caring, nursing, but man, it was special. That's the way we're to care for those in our spiritual underlings. Jesus says, I wanted to gather you like a chick. A hand gathers its chicks. Okay, compassionately, tenderly, mercifully. For those of you that are uh, disciples in the University of Acts, when the person you're working with doesn't have their memory verse memorized, how do you respond? See you next week. Work on it. Is there ridicule and criticism? Is there gentleness and tenderness? When that person that you've asked to do something for you doesn't do it, do they come trembling to let you know that they've let you down? Or is there a tenderness there, a willingness to come and to say, you know what, I need to work on this. Verse 8 says, having a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart not only the gospel of God to you, but also our own lives, because you have become very dear to us. Fond affection, experiencing a strong feeling intensified by an inner attachment. Okay, not just we're bridge partners, or we go to the same gym, but an inner connection, a sharing of lives, a fond affection. And because of that, they were well pleased, they were thrilled to impart not only the gospel, which again, you can share the gospel with no compassion at all, but that's not the way Paul did it. He shared not only the truth of the gospel, but his and their, that is Paul and Sylvanus as well, their own lives. And the word lives there is soul. 
It wasn't just a job, a responsibility, a duty. It was a compassionate, heartfelt sharing of the most important things in their life with those that they were seeking to see come to Jesus and to grow in him. It's discipleship. It's what I call life transference. The things that that God has imparted to me, shared with me, inculcated in my life, I do my best to share those things with others in a tender, gentle, affectionate way so that they can grow in Christ. Why? Because they become very dear to him. Very dear, beloved, uniquely loved in a class of their own. We're reading a book with some of the college students um, talking about discipleship and the, the lesson, with, with the chapters we read last week, we're talking about um, people as people, not as projects. And it's so easy to say, you know, look at my calendar and go, oh, got a rune this week, Wednesday at 6. Oh, got Tony, Thursday at 5. Oh, got Gino. And it's like my my to-do list, my calendar, my events, my schedule. That's a human, a soul with concerns and cares and frustrations and hurts. Are these people dear to you? Or are they the person that took your chair this morning and moved your Bible out of the way? How do we view those that we're in fellowship with? You recall, brethren, our hardship? How we work night and day as to not be a burden to any of you. We proclaim to you the gospel of God. For you recall, brethren, you are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behaved toward you believers. Okay, this is kind of a transition in between the the mom and the dad, but just again a reminder of of Paul's work among them in Thessalonica. You know, it's interesting, it talks about the fact that they were there for three Sabbaths, but I think they were there longer. They went to the, the synagogue for three Sabbaths, but how did they establish a church, open a business, get two different gifts from the believers in Philippi within three weeks? Do you think that's a reasonable time frame? I'm thinking probably not. They were there for a while, and they worked hard. Okay, our labor and hardship. Okay, it was difficult. Um, the idea there, well, where's labor and hardship? Hardship says difficult labor involving suffering, strenuous toil, and I was just thinking of this word, and, and again, as we're transitioning into fathers in a second, I was thinking about when, when we moved to Cupertino from Sunnyvale. I was in, I think, fifth grade, fourth or fifth grade. And I remember our, our backyard had a bunch of bamboo. I don't know why, but I mean, you know, like three to four feet high bamboo all in our backyard. And we have a pretty big yard. And uh, I remember my dad said, okay, I'm going to go dig up some bamboo so that we can put in a lawn and you guys can play. I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. And I just remember this day very clearly. It was pouring rain. I mean, it was like typhoon kind of rain. It was brutal. And I'm in in the house probably watching TV. And I remember going to the sliding glass door of my parents' bedroom and opening the curtains and seeing my dad just in this whatever rain jacket just drenched and just picking away at this bamboo. Bamboo for hour after hour. And I'm like, how stupid. (laughs) But he was laboring for the care of his kids. I wanted lawn for my kids. And actually, it was kind of smart, because when it's so wet, it's a little easier to get those roots out, isn't it? But it was hard work. But he made that sacrifice willingly, because he loved his children. Paul made sacrifices when he was in Thessalonica. It talks about the fact that he was working night and day so that he wouldn't become a burden. 
As you read further in the scriptures, you know that the church in Thessalonica was pretty poor. And so Paul, while he could have been supported by them, said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to start my own business and make tents so that you won't have to bear any burden for my being here. He was willing to do whatever it took to meet the needs of those he was ministering to. And how did he do it? Devoutly, uprightly, and blamelessly. What a character. You know, it was interesting in these times, and unfortunately today as well, there's a lot of people that get into religion for profit. And they come in and they make a good scene and they flatter you and they tell you nice things about yourself and they they don't really mention like sin and things like that. But boy, they're really good at passing the offering. Promising you if you give a little, God will give you back. Drive around in really nice cars and nice homes and private airplanes. Well-known Christians that probably many of us read their books. I'm not sure that they're laboring night and day blamelessly. And it has an effect on how people view Christianity today, doesn't it? Paul and Timothy and Silvanus were good testimonies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they made an impact in an important city in Europe. Back to Paul and his desire to see people grow. He says, I treat them like a mom. I treat them like a dad. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you. Remember that from uh, Colossians. Every man, each one, every person is important to God. And they should be important to us as well. And so what was he doing? He was exhorting, encouraging, and imploring What do those things mean? It seems to me kind of like being a coach. Because I'm a coach, I can relate to that. There's different ways to motivate athletes. When I was an athlete, I got motivated by uh, criticism quite a bit. I was always goofing off, so I was always getting in trouble, and I was made to run because I was messing around. As a result, I got in pretty good shape because I was running a lot. So I was thankful for the fact that my coach was mean to me. I know it's warped logic, but it worked. I learned to be that kind of a coach that demanded a lot from my players. But you know what? The calendar changed, and people got soft. And you can't say mean things to people anymore. I didn't realize that. You have to come alongside and say, you know, you know it might be good if you, like, kick the ball. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to offend you or anything. I know, like, you know, your left foot is a little bit sensitive. <laughs> but it would really be awesome if you could, like, try to use it once in a while. You have to know how people respond. But, you know, it's interesting because I, I actually I coach a high school soccer team, and I meet with my, each individual player before the season starts, and we go over individual goals. And I try to talk to them. I say, okay, Tony, can I be mean to you? Okay, I, I want to know. And some kids say, yeah, you know what, coach, when, I, when you get mad at me, it gets me mad at you, and I want to prove you wrong. And that motivates me. And I'm saying, all right, excellent. I can be me. (laughs) Other guys are like, you know what? If you look at them cross-eyed, they crumble. And so you have to be very momish. And I don't mean that in a negative way. You have to be tender, gentle, and compassionate. Working with Christians... They're the same. Some of them are like, oh yeah, I'll show you. I'm going to memorize 72 verses next week. (laughs) And some of them just wilt under any kind of scrutiny. You have to know. 
how to treat people. And I think that's why there's so many different things in this passage. Sometimes you have to be the mom. Sometimes you have to be the dad. You have to be an encourager, an exhorter, an implorer, a challenger. Okay, and most of these words have the idea of coming alongside and encouraging, and challenging, imploring, begging, exhorting. You can do it. I know it was hard, but I have confidence in you, instilling hope that they can indeed succeed in the Christian life. I know this is an area of sin, but let's look back over the last year. There's improvement. You're doing better. Press on. Praise God. Don't wallow in the, in the guilt of the immediate sin. Get up, confess, forsake, repent, and move on. 1 John 1, 9 has no statute of limitations, has no maximum number. Okay, it doesn't expire. Every time you sin, every time you confess, God will forgive. We defeated in our sin. But you know what? The devil doesn't tell us that. And so we need to tell each other. We need to be encouragers, exhorters, implorers. You can do it. I know you can. God is faithful and he's working in your life. Are you a mom this morning? Are you a dad this morning? Do you care about anybody this morning? And I don't say that without purpose. There are some of us that live our Christian life alone. And we say, you know what? I'm all I can handle. And I need to focus on me. And while there is a bit of truth to that, again, I think it's a lie. We need each other. The analogies that we see in the scripture, there's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. We're parts of a body. We're part of a building. We're a community. We need one another. So regardless of where you think you're at, we need you. There's people in this room that only you can minister to in a special way. Ask God who that is and how that is. And we've got the principles on how to do it. But what is it that you're supposed to do? Encourage them to walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we see Paul talking about this several times throughout the scripture and other writers as well. In Ephesians 4, chapter 1, it says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. How's that? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to present the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, it's interesting, I actually preached on, on Ephesians 4, 1 through 5 last week at Grace, so if you've got another 45 minutes, um, we can go into that in detail. Look at these passages on your own. They're talking about how to walk. How do I live a life, conduct myself in a manner worthy of the Lord? Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, love, being diligent to preserve unity. Things that we can all work on, I'm sure. Philippians, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, that idea of unity once again, one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And be faith there is the doctrine, okay, holding fast to the doctrines of the scripture, worthy of the gospel. Later on in Ephesians chapter 4, this I say therefore and affirm together with the Lord, that you no longer walk just as the Gentiles did, also in the futility of their mind. And it goes on. And so if you want to look at Ephesians 4, um, I don't want to read the whole thing, but there's a lot of practical things in Ephesians 4, 17 to 32 that talk about how to live in a manner worthy of the Lord, how to walk the walk. He talks about putting off the old and putting on the new man. He talks about speaking the truth in love, as we mentioned earlier, being angry and not sinning. How do I do that? Not stealing, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. 
Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. And be kind to one another, tender hearted. Boy, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. How do we walk? The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought also to walk in the same manner as he walked. Walk in the same manner as Jesus himself. If these verses don't explain it well enough for you, read the Gospels and see how Jesus walked on this earth. That's what it looks like. Humility, compassion, tenderness towards others. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the former lust which is yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Because it is written, and I'm really sorry they wrote this, but this is hard. You shall be holy, for I am holy. We're called to the same holiness as God. That's how we're supposed to walk. And you know what? The person that's working with you, the person that's mentoring you, that's discipling you, that's encouraging you, can quote this verse. I have no greater joy than to hear my children walking in the truth. Are you helping others today? Do you care enough to help? If so, Paul gives you some guidelines as to how to do it. The way a mom would do it, gently and tenderly. The way a dad would do it, and exhorting and encouraging. If you feel like you're on the other side of the equation and you, you're trying to grow and to mature, and you know what? We probably should be on both sides of relationships in this sense. We should be working with someone and being worked with as well. Because if you think you've arrived, you're at the wrong address. Okay, your GPS needs to be recalibrated, recalculating. Always be looking to grow, to mature, to improve as a believer. And you do that by hanging around people that you want to be like. And then be that person so that others will want to hang around you and grow as a Christian as well. And maybe you're doing great this morning, but as you know, the theme of this book, you can't stop there. Finally then, brethren, we, requ we request and exhort you as a father in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. Never quit. Never get satisfied. Never be content that you've accomplished what God wants you to. There's more. The reward for faithfulness is more work, is more responsibility. But you know what? That means more growth, more blessing, more maturity, being more like Jesus Christ. You know, I replaced a couple of light bulbs in our bathroom this week. I think we have like, is it eight? I think there's eight light bulbs. Two of them were out, so it was a little dim, which is, you know, if you look like me, that's good. So I replaced two of them, and, you know, joking around with Vicky, I'm like, wow, it's so bright in here. She goes, yeah, I see things that I've never seen before. And I'm like, yeah, me too. Sometimes I don't like to look at myself in the mirror. There's a little more wrinkles. There's a little more gray. There's a little more flab. But sometimes it's good to take inventory and say, God, where am I? How am I looking? Am I looking more like Jesus? Because that's the goal. That's the end result. God has promised to make us like his son, and he's in that process. Are we sitting there like a lump, or are we cooperating? Because the more you cooperate, the better you'll look. And I know we all like the way we look, or want to like the way we look. Spiritually speaking, let God make you look like Jesus. Let's excel still more. Lord, we thank you that you're not done with us. We thank you that you are in the process of making us like Jesus. Lord, as we desire to grow in our Christian life, and I pray that we would desire to grow, help us to realize that you have challenges for us to walk in a manner worthy of yourself. 
Lord, as we do that, um, help us to look at the Lord Jesus. But Lord, we thank you too that you've given us people in our midst that we can walk with, we can imitate, we can learn from and grow with. Help us to take advantage of those relationships. Lord, help us also to provide those kind of relationships. Help us to be caring people that love others and want to see them grow in their faith. Help us to treat them tenderly, compassionately, encouragingly, and be good disciples, parents, if you will, in the spiritual life. Thank you for the example of Paul, Lord. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray.